Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Media Mayhem. Today, we're going to be talking about cults. I think it's a fascinating topic, and we have an expert here today, Rick Allen Ross. He's going to be coming to us from New Jersey via Skype, and he is the author of Cults Inside and Out, and you can get it on Amazon.com, and you should definitely read it because it's not just about a single cult, but it really talks extensively about the history of cults, cults that you probably have heard of throughout your life, ones that have come and gone, some that are still out in full force, and the commonalities and the characteristics that they all share. And he talks about some of the deprogramming that he has done during the course of his expertise dealing with people that have come out of cults or people that he has tried, helped to get out of cults. He is also the founder and executive director of the Cult Education Institute. So we're going to learn quite a bit today, go through some different kinds of cults that you may be aware of, some you may not, because he isn't focused on a single cult, but rather cults of all different shapes and sizes. So welcome to the show, Rick. I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you, Allison. It's nice to join you. Well, first of all, I'm going to start off with something that's a little bit broad so that we can give our audience um, some sort of a context in which to discuss this subject. And the first one is, my first question is, what makes an organization a destructive cult? And basically, what are the defining characteristics that we should be looking for and, and that would make us call something or see, perceive something as a cult, an organization? Well, first of all, I think you've hit on something, which is if a group is not destructive, if they don't hurt people, uh, they might be unusual, they might be eccentric, but who cares? Uh, there are uh, groups that I would define as benign cults. That is, uh, they fit perhaps two characteristics of the three that I will uh, go through that are the primary characteristics, but they do no harm. So if a group does no harm, they don't generate controversy, they don't uh, uh, pull people's attention. But I think there's a nucleus for the definition of a destructive cult. Uh, and it was written by a psychiatrist, Robert J. Lifton, in the early 80s. He, Lifton taught at Harvard Medical School, and he wrote a paper called Cult Formation. And he gave three basic criteria. Uh, the first one, and the most salient single criteria about destructive cults, is the presence of an absolute authoritarian leader who becomes the defining element and the driving force of the group. I mean, the beliefs or, or what the group says it's all about really kind of fades, and the group worships the leader and follows the leader, and the leader defines everything. Uh, it could be a guy like L. Ron Hubbard who created Scientology, or it could be someone like Jim Jones who was uh, responsible for the mass suicide murder at Jonestown. But whoever the personality is, that leader animates the group and defines it. Whatever he says is right is right, and whatever he says is wrong is wrong. The second is that the group has a process that Lipton calls thought reform, which we commonly call brainwashing, which is a process of breaking people down changing them, and then refreezing them in a new mindset uh, that is predisposed to be dependent upon the group leader and, and basically allows the group to have undue influence over people so that they begin to seemingly make choices that are not in their own best interest, but consistently in the best interest of the group. So the second of the, of the three criteria is the presence of a thought reform program, which is a synthesis of coercive persuasion and influence techniques. And there's quite a bit of research about this. In my book, I have a chapter devoted to cult brainwashing with the appropriate research footnotes so people can follow and find that research, which began in the late 50s and, and was published in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, right to today. Uh, when more and more uh, papers are coming out and people are, are exploring this uh, ability that groups have to persuade people. And then finally, the third criteria is the one you first mentioned, that the group does harm. Uh, that might vary by degree from group to group because not all destructive cults are equally destructive. Some just want your money. Some want much more than that. So there are groups that encourage people, uh, for example, not to see a doctor, not to take prescribed medication. Uh, that can be life-threatening. 
but there are other groups that simply want as much cash as they can get from you or perhaps free labor. And then it could escalate all the way to groups that have become violent and that have committed crimes. So you look for those three simple criteria, the leader being the defining element that it, and the driving force of the group and the focus of the group, two, that the group breaks people down to gain undue influence through a process of coercive persuasion, and then three, that the group hurts people and is destructive. And there you have the definition or the nucleus for the definition of a destructive cult. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the issue of uh, children or teens and and sort of the the group that, you know, people that are often targeted by different cults. And it's something that we were chatting about briefly before the show started. Is there something, a strong religious affiliation or something you could do in raising your children to prevent them from joining groups like, say, Scientology or the Kabbalah Center? I'm, I'm picking the Los Angeles, uh, the, some places that are here within you know, the realm of my experience. Is there some way to prevent your children from being susceptible to... Uh, thought reform and to uh, a cult leader, a la, say, an L. Ron Hubbard? I think the best, uh, the best defense is education, and the education needs to be very specific and focused on what is a destructive cult, how does a thought reform program work, uh, what, what is uh, coercive persuasion, and how would you know that someone was playing a kind of influence game to trick you into a group, and that uh, you would have some basic warning signs about the characteristics and behavior of a destructive cult. Because Allison, there is no common profile to who gets sucked in. I've done 500 interventions. And amongst those interventions were five medical doctors. Uh, one was a surgeon, another was an anesthesiologist. They were highly educated, very sophisticated. Uh, two of those doctors were devout Christians. One was a devout Hindu. And it does not matter whether you are religious, you're not religious, you're highly educated, you're, you're, you're not well educated, you're from the best family, you're from a troubled family. All of us go through times when we are feeling vulnerable, when we're going through a, a rough patch in our life. It could be a divorce, it could be work, it could be a physical illness. And at that juncture, someone can come along who we trust, a coworker, a friend, a relative, and say, hey, you know, I know where we can help you. I know where there are some answers for your difficulties. And at that point of vulnerability, people can get sucked in. And if there was, there's one common thread that I've seen in the many, many cases that I deal with and the complaints I receive daily uh, and the cases that I've worked on, it's that people were at a vulnerable time and it, they had the bad luck or misfortune to have somebody come along, someone who was trustworthy to them, someone who appeared to be acting in their best interest, who brought them into the group. And these groups are very deceptive. And I would liken it to a bait and switch confidence game, where what they say they're giving you is, in fact, the bait. But what they're really bringing you into is something entirely different. And that's when the switch occurs. Well, let's talk about that in terms of, say, Scientology. Uh, we've done a lot of shows on Scientology here on Media Mayhem. And when we've done the shows, we've often gotten uh, comments from you guys there at home that Scientology, what makes it not like other religions? It's like just a religion. Other religions make you have to pay money. Other religions ask you to make certain sacrifices and so forth and so on. Where is the bait and switch, so to speak, when we're talking talking about Scientology, and what is the difference between, say, an organized religion? I mean, there is a part in your book where you talk about that there is sexual abuse in some of these um, religious, in some of these cults, uh, where where children are sexually abused or they're groomed, say, uh, in, in some of the Mormon polygamous cults, where they're groomed uh, to have sex with their elders, and and or there's just plain child abuse where the elders are, you know, having sex. And then I thought to myself, well, we've got some of that going on in the Catholic Church. So what is, 
what is the, in when we talk about Scientology, just to be simple here, what is the bait and switch? And what is it that they do that makes them different than, say, other organized religions? Well, let me just uh, start out by saying that when people are, are abused in, in destructive cults, it's not by individual members of the group acting out. For example, a Catholic priest who, who molests children. He's not doing it because it's an encyclical and a doctrine of the church. But when people abuse children in a polygamous sect or in the Children of God, which was a notorious group uh, led once by Moses David Berg that's now called the Family International, uh, the abuse the sexual abuse of children is man, was mandated and is mandated. And that's why uh, the children are hurt. Not because of an individual who is troubled and acting out, but rather So it's because, mandated rather than tolerated, as we saw some of in the, in the it, church. I know people would argue that perhaps it wasn't mandated by the church doctrine. However, it was tolerated by some of the higher ups because, and, and not prosecuted. So the difference here would then be as part of the theology that the systematic abuse of children is part of the theological constructs of that particular cult. Exactly, right. and that and that the abuse is an uh, is an expected byproduct of the machine. That is the group that produces the abuse, not o- not only systematically but systemically, and that it's inherent in the way the group functions as mandated by the leader. So when we when we have people complaining about Scientology hurt me, we hear the same pattern of grievances and complaints. Because Scientology, in my opinion, is like a machine. And that machine, which was created by L. Ron Hubbard, produces casualty. It's the inherent nature of the machine. It's the nature of the training routine, the courses, going from clear to operating Satan 8 or whatever. If you, if you go across that bridge, you go into harm's way. That's my take on it. And the difference between Scientology and mainstream religion is, first of all, in mainstream religion, uh, you, you can find out what the religion believes for free. In Scientology, you have to pay for it, and it's expensive. In mainstream religion, they don't tell you that a Jew, a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim can all belong to the club. They tell you that they have a distinct and separate doctrine that separates them from other religions and that that boundary is delineated by their, their beliefs. And, and Scientologists will routinely say, and I've had it said to me, I was once walking in DC, I was on DuPont Circle, a Scientologist approached me, gave me a handout and said, hey, come to Scientology. We've got great courses that will empower you, that will change your life. And I was with a friend and they were kind of uh, half laughing because they thought, well, does the Scientologist know who, who he's talking to? And I said, well, aren't you a church? And I'm Jewish. You know, I'm Jewish. And so I, I'm not interested. And he said, you know what? You can be Jewish. You can be Buddhist. You can be Christian. You can be anything and belong to Scientology. And that is a deception. Because ultimately, when you become involved in Scientology, as you progress, you find out they do have a doctrine. They do have a belief system. And in fact, I told that young man, I said, excuse me, but aren't you the church of Scientology? I mean, don't you have tax-exempt status as a religious 501c3? Why are you telling me you're not a church? You can't be uh, two religions simultaneously, particularly if... They contradict each other. So I think there's that deception from the very beginning. Scientology selling itself as self-improvement, as a human potential empowerment, when in reality it's a religion and it has very specific beliefs that they kept hidden, uh, that they keep hidden, that, that they keep as a secret, and that you must pay them to find out. That's really different than uh, the Catholic Church or the synagogue or the Buddhists who basically give away whatever it is uh, that they believe and say, look, this is what we're all about. If you're interested, we can uh, continue. And uh, Scientology is totally different. 
Okay, let me ask you this, and this is something that we've also looked at. If somebody, say, a Tom Cruise, or there is a public spokesperson who's clearly um, very enmeshed in a, a particular cult and speaks out on their behalf, and a lot of people have said, well, that's, or you could say that's a victim of thought reformer, that's a victim of brainwashing, somebody who's in that cult trying to get other members. Do we hold the person who is trying to generate membership into this cult responsible for their actions if they are, in fact, a victim of thought reform? Well, the Manson family, the, the women that followed Charlie Manson, murdered because he completely brainwashed them, controlled them. And Manson was then convicted as a murderer, even though he was not at the crime scene. Why? Because Manson, according to Bugliosi's theory of prosecution, Vincent uh, Bugliosi, who recently passed away, that was the prosecutor of Charles Manson, uh, Bugliosi said he wielded his followers like a weapon, and he killed people with them. And those women are still in prison. They're going to die in prison. So there's a point of no return, I think. There's a point where you may commit a crime uh, under undue influence, and even though you're brainwashed, you're going to end up spending significant time, maybe the rest of your life in prison. And if you choose to be a poster boy for Scientology like Tom Cruise, even though I truly believe that he is under undue influence and that he is to a large extent a victim, not unlike Paul Hadges and other people that have talked about this and who have left, I think that ultimately he, he has something that he's got to... Uh, uh, bear on his conscience, which is that he has been used to recruit many people, and those people, many of them, have been hurt. And so I think there is a responsibility there. But I think that what most people don't understand is that L. Ron Hubbard was a genius in one sense. He was a genius at creating a machine that is the Scientology machine, that is a process of coercive persuasion a synthesis of influence techniques that Hubbard uh, mechanized and put into place that David Miscavige is running that machine today. And the genius of Hubbard was being able to create this machine and, and it's still going. It's still, it's still controlling people. It's still manipulating as it did when he was alive after his death. Now, is that unusual for a cult leader if somebody founds a cult and they are almost, I mean, Hubbard's a god or a demagogue in terms of t when you talk to Scientologists, and then somebody like a David Miscavige takes over. Is Miscavige um, uh, qualify as one of those leaders that we discussed at the top of the show? Does he fit in the three prongs of what constitutes a cult? Is he that leader official or... Is he has he failed to be that leader official and and there upon and there is part of the reason why Scientology has been having some of their problems. I mean, does the leader of a cult have to be alive? I guess is the is the real question. Well, in my opinion, David Miscavige occupies that uh, that position today, and he is revered and he has absolute authority over Scientology. I don't I don't see any difference between. Uh, David Miscavige and L. Ron Hubbard as far as exercising control and running the machine that is Scientology. I think arguably Miscavige is more ruthless, uh, more brutal than Hubbard. Uh, though Hubbard was the creator of this machine, and that machine is, is very, very well organized. Uh, I mean, the, the role of the ethics officer, the chorus leader, the, the training routines, what they call TRs, all of this puts a person through a process, and the end result is someone like Tom Cruise, like Kirstie Alley, who really doesn't think outside of the box. And the box is the box that Hubbard created for the mind, which he said was the ultimate science of the, of the mind. But what I see is simply thought reform, or what you would commonly call brainwashing, to gain undue influence over people, to turn people basically into puppets. And this is done by uh, the auditing, by the course, by the training routines, and it's a step-by-step -step, uh, process where as you move through Scientology, you begin to lose yourself and you begin to accept 
all of Scientology's value judgments, verbiage, everything. And you then adopt that mindset, that worldview, and you basically become a Hubbard or a Miscavige clone. And I think that, that Miscavige is, uh, the, the brutality that has been alleged about him uh, puts him perhaps in even a darker, uh, a darker place than Hubbard. Because I think Hubbard, I, I don't recall Hubbard having those kind of allegations. Now I want to talk about Kabbalah and switch gears a bit. Kabbalah is a uh, religious center here in, uh, it's in Los Angeles. It's also all in different places across the country. Uh, it's a form of Judaism and actually has been very popular with a lot of celebrities. It's not, I don't know how that popularity has ebbed and flowed over the years, but it certainly was um, in the early 2000s. And it has so many famous adherents such as Madonna and Sandra Bernhardt at one time or another. Uh, and and uh, Demi Moore. And so what I wanted to ask you about, it was rather unusual that I saw that you had included it because a lot of people are loath to say anything critical about Kabbalah or the Kabbalah Center. There is a place here in Los Angeles on Robertson. I had visited that place, not as a, in, in terms of doing a story on it, and I had my own feelings. But why does Kabbalah qualify as a cult? And what kind of harm is that particular or that alleged cult involved in, according to uh, your uh, uh, your review? Well, in my opinion, the Kabbalah Center, which is run by one family, the Berg, is a destructive cult. And I based that on all the complaints I, re I received. Uh, Allison, you know, look, I, I used to work for Jewish Family and Children's Service as a, as a staffer, and I talked for the Bureau of Jewish Education and served on a national committee concerning cults for the Union for Reform Judaism, which is the largest denomination of Judaism in the United States. And I've worked with many rabbis and with Jewish federations and, and, and with scholars. And I must tell you, the Kabbalah Center has really no credibility whatsoever in the mainstream of, of, of Jewish life in the sense of, of being uh, accredited within the Jew Jewish organizations, such as the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles or the Jewish Federation of Las Vegas or Phoenix. In fact, I've been asked to speak as a guest speaker to make those distinctions. And the Kabbalistic scholars in Israel and the United States, quite frankly, think that the Kabbalah Center is a joke. It's really an idiosyncratic composite philosophy put together by a guy who started out as an insurance salesman. His name was Feivel Gruberger, and he became Philip Berg. Now, he did have an ordination, I think, uh, in, as an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, but he made his living primarily selling insurance. He then left his wife in Israel and his children, married a woman named Karen, who now is Karen Berg, his widow. He since passed away, and they had two children. Michael Berg and Yehuda Berg. And they run the Kabbalah Center, which has 501c3 status as a tax-exempt religious organization. They run it like a family business. And they've got three little McMansions in Beverly Hills, two for the baby Bergs on either side and one for Karen in the middle. And they live large. Uh, Karen, I've had people call me and talk to me about the shopping sprees that Karen Berg has on Rodeo Drive, where she spends just enormous amounts of cash on herself. And so what the Kabbalah Center really is, to me, is the Berg family business and the Berg piggy bank. And Madonna is still in. Sandra Bernhardt seems to have dropped out. Donna Karen is all the way in. Uh, Demi Moore is still involved. And Ashton Kutcher has been hanging out there as well. Uh, so the Kabbalah Center isn't really as big as they say they are. Like Scientology, they grossly exaggerate their numbers. They'll tell you, oh, we have a million students or whatever. I don't even know that they have a thousand truly committed members, certainly not more than two or three thousand that attend major events. So like Scientology saying that they have millions and they really maybe only have 25 to 50,000 truly committed Scientologists, the Kabbalah Center is kind of like a little Scientology. And they have 
hundreds of people, maybe just a few thousand. But like Scientology, they're really rich and they give a lot of money. I mean, Madonna's probably given over $10 million dollars herself alone. Don't they also, there's also something very interesting about it and something that I noticed also with Scientology, I mean, and, and granted, I'm, I'm not even remotely an expert in this area, but there was something I noticed and I wondered if it was significant or not, but there is a certain anti-intellectualism about how to study at, at the Kabbalah Center in that you don't need to know Hebrew, you could simply look at a letter and touch something, and I wonder, is that for marketing purposes so that nobody needs to really have to learn anything and they certainly can continue to buy materials? Or, I mean, what is what is the basis of that? It's certainly not like the rest of any kind of Judaism, um, which is always based on, uh, on uh, there is an intellectual component to it. So I'm just curious about that. And my second part of my question is also the issue of how they availed, allowed Kabbalah to be available for women and use that as a way to differentiate themselves from mainstream Judaism. Well, you know, I mean, Orthodox it's Judaism. basically, it's basically, Allison, it's marketing. You know, it's, uh, as, as we say in Yiddish, it's a marketing mishagat. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have, they have the, the, the red string bracelet that you can buy that supposedly will protect you from the evil eye or whatever. They have Kabbalah water that they claim will pro- give you special health and they even at times claim it can cure certain diseases. So, and then they sell books. They sell, you know, the Zohar, uh, which is the primary text that people use to study Kabbalah, which is a form of Jewish mysticism that has been around for centuries. I mean, I don't get complaints about the Kabbalah. I only get complaints about the Berg Center, their Kabbalah Center. And they teach that you can scan the pages, not even knowing how to read Hebrew, and somehow the pages, the book, can give you a special mystical uh, aura. And I that know, you, it's, like, it's like a class for stupid people. Well, it's, it's look, it, it, I think that the same kind of coercive persuasion and thought reform that other groups use, the Kabbalah Center uses. For example, you get involved, you, you tell them a lot of intimate details in your life, and then someone in the Kabbalah Center who's a staffer, they call them the Hevra, which is Hebrew for friends, they will do an astrological chart a- about you. What you don't know is that they've been fed information by the teacher, by your buddies that you've been talking to at the center, and then suddenly you're given this chart and it seems very telling, you know, kind of like a psychic doing a cold reading. And you, you're, 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 you're hooked. You, you say, well, how could they possibly know all this? And then they start telling you about your life and where you should be going. And they're, they're beginning to pull the strings. They're beginning to manipulate. So the same kind of game that, in my opinion, Scientology plays, the Kabbalah Center plays. Though the Kabbalah Center, maybe they're worth a hundred million. Scientology, as we know, is worth billions. So uh, L. Ron Hubbard was much better at playing games than Philip Byrd. Let me ask you this, too, because you're, you function as someone who goes in and tries to get people out of these cults. What does that process entail, and, and, and what kind of circumstances need to be present in order for it to be successful? Well, basically, uh, it's been called culty programming, and it started in the 70s. And in my book, Cults Inside Out, I talk about the history of cult intervention work, how it started with the first culty programmer in California, Ted Patrick. They recently made a documentary uh, about Ted Patrick and his life. It's called Deprogrammed, and it recently premiered in Toronto. And I was interviewed for that. And then it evolved into what it is today or how I use it today. And we call it simply intervention or cult intervention. It's much like an uh, alcohol or drug intervention. A family contacts me. They're concerned about a loved one who's involved in a group. It could be a spouse calling me. It could also be adult children of a parent who is involved in a group. So I am contacted. Uh, there's a process of assessment because many, many times families will call me and I'll tell them, you know, that group is not a destructive cult. 
and you're becoming unnecessarily alarmed. Simply because the group is unusual or eccentric does not mean it's a destructive cult. But many times the family is right because they know their loved ones and they can see these radical change, changes in behavior. So then they go through a preparation process and then the intervention will usually take three or four days, eight hours a day, which means 24 hours to 32 hours of work. And I would break the intervention down, and I do in the book in great detail, into four basic blocks. One, talking about what is the definition for a destructive cult, and then asking questions about the group of, that has drawn concern. Number two, talking about thought reform and course of persuasion, and asking questions, basically, is there a parallel? to the group that has drawn concern. And then three, uh, what are the secrets of this particular leader or group or organization that you may not know uh, that you should know to make a more informed decision about continuing if you choose to continue with this group? And then finally, the fourth block is why is your family sitting here? Why are your loved ones concerned about you? What has happened? that has caused them concern, because the family is right there in the room with me, working with me. And I've done 500 of these interventions over the years. It's an educational process, not counseling, not therapy. And my success rate, and I talk about this in the book, has been about 75%. Now, let me ask you this. When we talk about you're talking to somebody that is in one of these cults or you're talking to the family who has a loved one who's in the cult. We talked about that they do harm. Um, Are there certain cults that are on the rise or particularly powerful right now that you think are among, say, the top five most harmful cults? I mean, maybe you could um, educate us a bit about some of those groups that really have a lot of family members contacting you right now and things that we should be looking out for at this point. Well, I have received consistent complaints about Scientology, about the Kabbalah Center, hundreds of complaints. So uh, I think what's important for, for people to understand is that the big groups from the 70s are still around. Scientology is still here. Uh, the Kabbalah Center, which started in the 90s, is still around. Uh, the Unification Church, uh, founded by Reverend Moon, once called the Moonies, is still here. They're still hitting college campuses, recruiting people. And the empire that Moon created, he died in the, in, not too long ago in his 90s, has now been inherited by his children, and it is being run by his children. There are a number of Korean groups that have come from South Korea that are recruiting in the U.S. There are also other groups from Asia that have come to the U.S. Uh, For example, Falun Gong, led by Lee Hongji. Uh, He is exiled from China, but he's recruiting in the United States and Canada. He currently has approximately 10,000 followers in North America. Uh, the, The polygamist groups that we're talking about, there are probably 50,000 uh, polygamists approximately living in North America. And this is a generational phenomenon. There are people that have had generation after generation living in these polygamous sects, and they are often quite isolated. They run two towns in the United States, Hilldale, Utah, Colorado City, Arizona. And then in Spindale, North Carolina, there's a group called Word of Faith Fellowship. Uh, that dominates that particular town and has been called a cult. Uh, There are large group awareness training seminars that have been called cult-like. For example, people joke about S from the 70s. S became uh, landmark education. S was Earhart Seminars Training, named for Werner Earhart, its founder and creator, who's still alive. And then it became landmark education, in the 90s. It's now called Landmark Worldwide, and they teach the forum. And corporations like Nike, Lululemon, and others have uh, encouraged employees to take that training. And that organization has a history of labor violations, bad press, lawsuits for personal injuries, 
I mean, this is an organization that has a very troubled history. And so all of these groups are out there. They're all making money. And that's the bottom line is that this kind of business, this kind of confidence game, this kind of operation is a money maker. And people are in it for the money and they're in it for the power. Now, if you, this is just my last question, and we were talking about the harm of these cults, and I think a lot of people come back with, well, if we are getting something out of it, does it matter that that's where we want to give our money to? That's who we want to give our money to. When does the demand for money um, from these cults, who clearly are, as you said, doing quite well and, and taking a lot of money from these participants, where does the the, the member uh, you know, where do, where should they be drawing the line? I mean, where does it become really, really harmful? Because there are religious organizations that ask for tithing. There are religious organizations that ask for donations. Um, it is not cheap to belong to a temple, so forth and so on. So what are we talking about here when we talk about financial harm? Well, I mean, when, when we talk about financial harm, I, I've talked to people who are bank, have been bankrupted by the Kabbalah Center and by Scientology. They've just been cleaned out. Uh, there's just this loud sucking sound at their bank where all their money is being funneled into courses and curriculum, into amulets and Kabbalah water or whatever. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So people actually fold. They go bankrupt. They don't pay their rent. They quit their job. They become a full-time sea organization staffer or they become a, a hebra, a full-time staffer at the Kabbalah Center. I think, Allison, where the rubber meets the road is when someone makes a supernatural claim that cannot be proven about a higher power that they claim to represent, and, th- and it boils down to, uh, I want you to stop making your mortgage payment. I want you to leave your wife. I want you to stop talking to your family. When they start making those kind of demands, it's time to really get involved in drilling down into what this group is all about, and you better be sure that this group is for real, that they are on the up and up, that they have nothing to hide before you sacrifice a meaningful part of your life. And and that's what we're talking about. I mean, I've had people call me that were involved in Scientology or were involved in the Kabbalah Center that left a spouse or a spouse left them because of their involvement in the group. A one intervention I did to get a Scientologist out that I write about in the, in the book uh, is this man was in Scientology for many, many years, 27 years of his life. And he, his wife kind of took courses. She humored him. She went along. His children did the same. But at one point, Scientology wanted him to become a Sea Org member. They wanted him to come into the Sea Organization because he had special talents that they could utilize. He would become their cheap labor. And uh, that meant leaving his wife, leaving his children, and, and going into Sea Organization and living in, in Scientology housing. He actually handed his wife the divorce papers after many, many years of marriage. That's what it comes down to. The intervention ended up uh, bringing him out of Scientology, and he is still married to his, his wife, and he's with his children. But he almost gave up his entire family for Scientology. So what I would say to someone is, where, where is your point, your breaking point, when you are not willing to go any further? When someone is pressuring you so much, and, and the demands are so high, that you're almost at the breaking point. At that point, you need to stop, take a pause, take a rest, drill down, which you can do on the web. And as you've mentioned, the Cult Education Institute is one of the largest databases on the web where you can find the information about these groups. So my advice to people is know who you're willing to give up your life for. Know who you're willing to get divorced for, to give up your home, your job, your financial security, before you raid your 401k and hand them the cash, you better be sure. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm going to end it on that note because I think it's incredibly helpful. 
want to thank you for being here with us, and I hope you'll come back because I added a bunch of other questions. But I think we're get, we're starting our education here and learning about details. And we didn't we only hit a couple of uh, different uh, cults, but hopefully we could talk about some more in the future. So thanks so much, Rick, and I want to thank you all for watching. I hope that you learned as much as I did today, and we look forward to hearing your comments. And we'll see you next time on Media Mayhem.